Morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to today's Scientist in Every Florida School live stream event, where we're going to bring you plate tectonics with volcanologist Robert Constantinesco with uh, University of South Florida. We're going to get started um, in just a moment, but I just wanted to give you a reminder that I am pressing into the chat box now for you a couple of reminders. You can put any questions in the chat box for our scientists. And I've also put a document in there as well with extension and activities resources for you to use uh, in conjunction with today's presentation. So without any further ado, I'm gonna turn things over to our scientist, Robert. Robert, take it away. Okay, everybody's hearing me well. Uh, so I'm Robert Constantinescu, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm a volcanologist in training at USF Tampa, and I'm going to try to walk you through plate tectonics, and the topic of today will be Earth, a dynamic planet, because as we can see in this uh, nice animation here, it is indeed a dynamic planet. I'll be going through some concepts, a bit of geology, continental drift and plate tectonics, the main topic, and some of the cool effects that are happening when uh, these plate tectonics meet. So uh, let's start with who studies Earth because uh, there's a wide array of sciences that actually the horse is I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry for the, no presentation. I'm receiving messages, there's no presentation, sorry. Um, you should be good. You wanna share your screen with us? I didn't share the screen? Oh, no, nope, not yet. <laughs> okay. That's perfect, looks good now. Yeah. Uh, so now uh, everybody sees the screen. You're good. Yeah, I was talking about uh, who studies it, right? Because there's so many sciences or subdisciplines that are studying the planet. And uh, under the umbrella of earth sciences or geosciences, there's geography who studies the land features, what you see on the surface, geophysics who deals with the physical properties of the planet, like magnetism, gravity. We get geochemists studying the, the, the makeup of the rocks and minerals, and a bunch of other sciences. But what exactly is geology part, geology part in this thing? Well, geology is the study of the solid earth, earth as a planet, as a solid body, and the materials it is made of. And uh, it is part today of planetary geology, because since NASA started to send probes out there, uh, we're still using the same geology principles to study all the other planets in the solar system or even beyond. And part of the geology is to study the processes that change the planet over time. So who exactly invented this concept of geology at some point? Because uh, a few hundred years ago, there was scientists called naturalists who were studying the planet as a whole with everything, biology and everything on top of it. But we have this Scottish person James Hutton, he's considered the father of modern geology. And he basically established this uh, geology as a science. And uh, why is that important is because he was the first to actually uh, realize that features on, of the earth crust, like we see mountains and valleys, plateaus, canyons, everything is a, the result of natural processes acting over geological time. And the geological time is a key concept because in geologically speaking, time passes a bit different than for us. Processes happen along millions of years, billions of years. Whereas what we can see in a, during a, the, the lifespan of a human being, it's pretty much very, very, very small part of the geological process. If we talk about erosion, for example, you, we hardly see that rocks are eroding away, right? So geological time plays an important role when we're talking about the scale of the earth. So where does uh, the continental drift and plate tectonics fit in? Uh, well, there was a time when uh, scientists were considering the Earth was pretty much a, a static body. There's nothing happening. And uh, 
geologists of the era basically were doing descriptive work. They were they will describe the land features, the mountains, they'll describe the rocks and minerals, but very few of them were asking, okay, we see this, we describe this, but how all this came to be? Uh, so it took a meteorologist slash astronomer slash an all round scientist called Alfred Wegener in 1912, who was looking at uh, the map of the world and realized that, hey, if you look closely, uh, Africa seems like uh, it's been joined with uh, South America and any other continent is the same. And he started to follow these clues because, hey, they, they look like at some point they were joined together. And he started to find fossils and, of animals and plants that they look the same like in South Africa and South, South America or, or on a, all other continents. They say, wow, how can they be the same and, and yet split apart by thousands of miles of ocean? So he launched this idea of continental drift. It means that the continents were, were at some point joined together in a large landmass which split it over time. And we see here an animation of this giant landmass called Pangaea that Wegener proposed, which uh, about 200 million years ago started to split into the continents that we see today. So this was the continental drift idea. But like any great idea in science, well, it was laughed at for several years, especially because Wegener wasn't a geologist per se. And uh, the scientific peers were laughing, hey, no, not true, not really. So things started to actually look better after the World War II. Uh, and surprisingly, the military and the technology developed initially for warfare started to unravel some mysteries of the planet. Like for example, the military invented the seismometers. They were using the seismometers to detect nuclear tests made by foreign powers. But coincidentally, they actually recorded naturally occurring earthquakes. And uh, the US Navy crossing the Atlantic to, to, to map the ocean floor uh, in order to provide summaries with a more detailed map of the, uh, of the ocean, they started to realize where they, didn't, where they didn't expect in the middle of the Atlantic, instead of finding a, an abyssal plain, an ocean floor, they find this huge mountain range thousands of feet high, crisscrossed with valleys and canyons. And we're like, wow, what's this feature? They call it a mid-ocean ridge, right? But further subsequent studies in magnetometry and uh, geochemistry and so forth, they found out something interesting that all the rocks at the mid-ocean ridge with red here, they were less than 10 million years old and even very close to nowadays. And the further away you move towards the shores, like we see here in North Africa or or the Eastern coast of US, rocks are 180 million years old. So how come this happen This is happening? Further studies in, until like the 70s, early 70s, after many, many campaigns of mapping the world's oceans, scientists, geologists realized, wow, all the Earth's oceans are actually uh, harboring this long mountain range, close to 65,000 kilometers long all the oceans. So this means that at some point in time, there was no oceans here, but they started to form. And uh, they are initiated at these mid-ocean regions. So once in the 70s, once the scientists realized that this, okay, there are tectonic plates moving around, continental drift theory started to, 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 to come together. Uh, Several nine major tectonic plates were identified. We see them here with different colors. There's some smaller ones. Uh, scientists proposed, okay, this is this theory of plate tectonics. Plates are created at mid-ocean ridges, but well, the planet is a finite space, right? You cannot just grow plates at the mid-ocean ridges forever. They must end someplace. So they looked at the other, the opposite ends, because as the technology developed and we started to follow the motion of the plates, we see that in some places they collide 
like we see here, this, th these arrows indicate the direction of the plates, right? In some places, they move away from each other, like in the mid-ocean region, the Atlantic, we see here. And in some places, they move past one another. So it's all this movement. But how is this movement coming? Because it's not, it's, it's not very intuitive. So to fully understand the dynamics of the planet and how these plates, tectonic move and everything, we actually have to go back in the deep time until the creation of our solar system. Deep time is a concept even, even more powerful than the geological time because usually deep time is used by astronomers to, to talk about the evolution of the universe in billions and billions of years. So we have to go back to the start of our solar system because this is important. And we see in this example, some nebula, what scientists call nebula, and they are basically interstellar clouds of gas and dust. Here is an example of the pillars of creation, a photo taken by Hubble telescope. And inside of it, we see these red dots, which are real star nurseries, solar systems being born. So somehow like this, our solar system came to being about 5 billion years ago. So at least it's what we think. So at some point, this um, gas and dust starts to coalesce, to, 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 to clump together. And as it clumps together, it gets more and more gravity, it gets a little bit of momentum, it starts to spin very fast. Uh, and this cloud starts to, to, to flatten and create a disk, this continuous rotation, this continuous movement and centrifugal forces and gravity starts to coalesce more and more matter at the center of this disk, where a, a star is coming to life at some point, it sparks to life. And the, the remaining material starts to coalesce, like we see here in these diagrams, into the planets that we see today. This process takes hundreds of millions of years. So once the star is formed and um, the protoplanetary disk, as we call it, has this remaining material, right? This material starts to clump together in a process called accretion. And as these uh, lumps of matter, they keep growing and growing and growing, and they become this huge, homogeneous body, like a planet size, what scientists call the planetesimal or an infant planet. And uh, this planet keeps clumping more and more material from the remaining uh, protoplanetary disk. There's a bunch of uh, bombardment from asteroids and comets. And at some point, this planet is so massive, the pressure inside it grows, it grows, it grows, so it reaches it increases the temperature until pretty much everything is melted. This uh, comet and meteor bombardment continuously are melting the planet for hundreds of millions of years. And at some point when the, the bombardment, as the scientists call it, the heavy bombardment finished, well, we are remaining basically with a molten planet that being exposed to the coldness of space, which is pretty much minus 270 degrees Celsius, the crust starts to form on top. And before you know it, over some million, million of years, the crust starts to cool down. Some heavy elements in this molten material start to, to, to sink like iron and nickel. And over time, over time, all this material differentiates based on its density and temperature and Earth started to, to form an inner structure, a coherent inner structure in layers of different physical, chemical, or mechanical properties. And uh, because of seismic waves, we now know that Earth is made of a, of a solid inner core, which is made of iron and nickel, uh, surrounded by an outer liquid core made solely of iron, and we get the, the, the thickest part of, of the planet, the mantle, which is a viscoelastic material, we call it, uh, kind of like the modeling putty everybody used when he was kids and modeling different shapes. Uh, and on top of this floats the crust on which we live and which is made basically of the plate tectonics and is the thinnest layer of the planet. So now that we have this idea of uh, how do we get this dynamicity of the planet? It turns out it's all the remaining heat from the fiery birth of the solar system 
that led to the structuring of the earth and we finally get some liquid some solid so inherently some things start to actually move and we, if we go back to plate tectonics and all these movements that we see here we mentioned earlier this we notice places where plates are moving away from another where they collide or they move past one another so clearly there is different action here what happens as all these places if we look at this diagram let's let's take for example the mid ocean ridge that we talked earlier in mid ocean ridge here that we see here we call a divergent plate boundary because as this mantle material pushes upwards it moves sideways right so it's a divergent here the tectonic plates move away from one another and obviously if they are clumped together at some point at another point they have to disappear because we said the planet is a finite space so thousands of miles away and over some million of years these plates that move away from from the divergent margin they start to collide with a continent or another ocean oceanic crust and they start to to, to, to slide under it because the oceanic crust is heavier and denser than continental crust. It's a process called subduction or a convergent plate margin. And when the, the plates are moving one past another, like we see in this diagram here, we call that a transform plate margin. So we have basically three main times of contact between tectonic plates, a divergent margin, where, which is a constructive margin because new crust is formed, we have convergent or subduction margin where the crust is basically recycled and the transform margin where, well, it's neither a creative or a destructive process, but it has its, uh, its perks as we'll see later. So let's delve a bit into the divergent plate boundaries. We see in these animations here that something happens. So material is coming from, from below and it, 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 it melts. And the bricks melt under the thin crust and over time it it spreads apart the crust and it's moving it sideways so why is this happening well there's the contrast of temperatures that we saw earlier in this strata of the earth uh, closer to the uh, to the nucleus the temperatures are higher than at the surface and this creates a density contrast between materials the, the heavy material will start to sink and the cotton material will start to to uplift, we call this a mantle upwelling. We see here below in this diagram, nice diagram that hot mantle is rising up under the crust. And what happens when you look here on the right, when this man hot mantle material ascending in form of convection curves reaches the thin crust, over time it eats away at it, it melts the crust. And while cracking it because of this thinning, new magma or which is basically now melted mantle starts to come to the surface and easily seeps in solidifies and this process repeats all over again until the extension the the spreading starts to form in in this diagram basically summarizes how all the oceans were formed at some point some giant half planet size convection currents bring hot magma and slowly over time, it seeps into the crust and pushes it away, and we have an ocean. This actually process, this process happens today in the East African Rift, where the Horn of Africa, if you know, if you remember the, the geography of Africa, the Horn, where the Somalia, it's moving away, it's splitting from the continent. Over millions of years, we'll have a, a nice ocean. And this happened with Pangaea at the time, at 200 million years ago. So if we look at the world map now, and and uh, plot the location of earthquakes see with yellow here or the active volcanoes with red we see they follow pretty much the the plate tectonics boundaries including this extensional or divergent plate boundary right in the mid atlantic so what happens here is as this mantle upwelling thins the crust the seeps in it creates volcanoes and this is one of the after effects of plate tectonics boundaries the creation of volcanoes. And we here have a nice example of a volcanic eruption typical to divergent plate margins. It's a, called a fissure eruption. It's usually characterized by massive outpours of lava, massive. 
Luckily for us, we can outrun the lava, but it for surely will destroy pretty much we built around. Uh, we've seen probably on news on TV, the eruption in 2018 in Hawaii. And uh, let's, let's get back a little. This activity here is actually associated with earthquakes. Earthquakes was, were one of the main clue that scientists had to determine the, the plate tectonics uh, processes. Uh, so as the as the crust being rigid and pushed from below from the by the upwelling mantle it cracks all these cracks split the crust and may, as it moves it creates all these earthquakes this shaking that we feel uh, but at the other end of the of the plate we have the convergent plate boundaries and uh, here is where we said it's the plates are recycled, basically the denser oceanic plate, as we see here with this uh, red arrows, is seeking under a continental plate because it's heavier. Over the millions of years, it accumulated a, a layer upon layer of sediment, ocean sediments filled with water. So everything is heavier and denser. So it starts to sink under the continent. And when it reaches about 100 miles deep, the temperatures are so high that it starts to melt all this material. This new material being hotter and, and less dense, it starts to buoyantly rise through the crust, right? And at some point it stops when the balance of densities is reached, it starts and it forms the magma chambers. When this magma chamber in the, finally is overpressurized, this material melted mantle called magma reaches the surface and explodes in violent, volcanic eruptions. And we have three types of such subduction zones when uh, oceanic crust is uh, subducting over uh, under continental crust like here, or it's subducting under another ocean crust, which uh, will create island darks like the Caribbean, the Philippines, Japan, or we have a contact of subduction like continent continent. Uh, which creates large mountain ranges for the best example here will be the Himalayas, which are, were created but from the collision of the Indian subcontinent with Asia. Uh, they don't really follow the same process because we don't, we are not quite 100% sure it's the same subduction process because basically the two continents will have the same density, how they get one under the other. Uh, we think that as they collide, they push against one another, they form this melange of rock, they, this accretion here, which over time changes the balances of masses on the plate. So in the end, one ends up sliding under the other, as we see here. So again, if you look at the world map, we see earthquakes associated all the plate margins, including this convergent plate margin. And the most famous one is this Pacific ring of fire that we see here all nice volcanic activity, the explosive one happens around this specific uh, ring of fire. And we see here the typical eruptions are explosive. These are the, the, the eruptions that you don't see the red glowing hot magma flowing, but is actually blown into smithereens because it's very rich in gases. So this type of explosive eruptions are actually the deadliest ones as the magma here reaches the surface, it explodes and creates various volcanic phenomena like Tephra fallout that we call a lava flows, pyroclastic flows, these flowing clouds of material we see even here in this image on the side, they are several hundred uh, uh, degrees Celsius in temperature and they travel hundreds of kilometers per hour on the volcano flanks. Only in 2018 in Guatemala, a small volcanic eruption, explosives killed about 300 people. So we see along the Pacific Ring of Fire are the most violent volcanic activity. And in the same time, because the plates slide one under the other, and they are not smooth, they are not uh, uh, like soap, they are rough. We see the plate is carrying sea mounts, for example, and at some point they get stuck, they get locked. And as the, the plate, they keep trying, trying to move, but they can't, they are in this lock, it gathers a lot of energy, which at some point it snaps. And uh, this is how an earthquake is created. Earthquake basically releases energy in form of seismic waves. And this travels to the ground and create the shaking that we all feel. And we see here in these nice simulations here how the, 
the, the seismic wave, the earthquake wave is, is traveling through the crust. Uh, there are many types of waves, but P waves or primary waves and S waves are the most important. So we see the P wave is a compressionary wave. We see it compresses the material ahead of it and relaxes behind. Whereas the S wave is an up and down motion. All these motions combined give the destructiveness of the earthquakes. And one of the after effects of these earthquakes happening, especially in convergent plate margins, leads to creation of tsunamis. Uh, you've probably seen on TV a lot of tsunami and you see it's like a huge, the whole ocean is coming right at you. They're not like your usually sea waves that you see on a day at the beach in Clearwater or another beach in Florida because the sea waves that we see is just the surface of the water coming at us. But in tsunamis, the whole full body of water like we see in the simulations here, when the earthquake snaps the plate upwards, it dislocates the entire column of water which starts to travel across the ocean. And when it reaches shallower waters, it basically overwhelms the shore with wave after wave after wave after wave of water. And it's very destructive. We, you probably have heard of the Fukushima earthquake in 2000, 2011 in Japan, killed several thousand of people. Or in 2004 in Indonesia, an earthquake like that snapped the seafloor along hundreds of kilometers and for a few tens of meters high. And the ensuing tsunamis killed about 240,000 people. So a lot of cool action happens when plates collide. It's destructive, yes, but it's also beautiful. And now we know how all this works because we developed these theories and which further explain all these processes, the plate tectonics and continental drift. We reach the final, uh, the, the last of the plate boundary, which is the transform plate boundaries which usually are associated with mid ocean ridges. We said that here plates are moving one past another. And uh, this moving again, because plates are not smooth, at some point they get interlocked and they snap and they form an earthquake. This happens a lot uh, that we see on land. Most of these transform plates uh, boundaries are under ocean, but in some places like Iceland or uh, East African Rift or uh, South California, they, 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 they are on land. And we see that the Pacific plate in California, actually it's moving north with respect to North American plate. And when they snap, they create these earthquakes. And I'm pretty sure most of you uh, saw the movie, the San, San Andreas movie with the famous Dwayne the Rock Johnson and all the destructions such an earthquake brings. Well, it's pretty much true. Uh, San Francisco had a devastating earthquake in 1906 because of these processes. Uh, so let's summarize a bit. What do, did we learn is that because of its fiery birth, the planet developed over millions of years an inner structure of layers of different densities and temperatures, some solid, some liquid. And this, this layering basically allowed the development of, the, of plate tectonics, the, the large slabs of crust that are floating on the asthenosphere and moving around. And uh, because of the huge convection currents, the, the, the temperature contrast in, in, in the inner layers of the earth, we get all this movement which expresses at the surface at different divergent and convergent plates in earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. So in the end, it turns out that continental drift and plate tectonics are the single most important theories in geologies because they really explain all the dynamic processes, everything that happened on Earth since its birth and for billions of years to come. We can now have simulations that we can show what the continents will look like hundreds of millions of years from now. These theories are the strongest theories in geology that were ever created and ever since we didn't make any other breakthroughs like that. And there's a, a lot of topic here. There's a lot to discuss about these processes, but uh, this is the, an overview, a general overview of what's happening on Earth as a dynamic planet. Thank you. Robert, thank you so much for sharing a lot of really fascinating information with us. Uh, we're gonna quickly do some Q and A's. We probably have time for about three to four questions. Our first question is gonna come from a middle school in Duval County where students are asking, how fast do plates move? Uh, 
So uh, plays don't move really fast. They pretty much move about the rate of the growth of a fingernail, which will be between 2.5 to 8 centimeters, maybe 10 in some places per year. We know this because uh, as technology evolved, we installed GPS stations at these plate margins, and we're monitoring from space, and we see that slowly, centimeters per year, they move away from each other or colliding. I think the fastest uh, movement is in uh, South Pacific, about 10 centimeters per year, but most of the plates move at about two centimeters per year, close to one inch. Thank you. Uh, our next question comes from a middle school in Palm Beach County, and they are curious, why do you study volcanology in Florida if there are no volcanoes here? Well, I get this question all, all, all of the time. Um, it's not a question if volcanoes are here, it's a question of uh, the department, the university, having funding and good professors at this thing. Uh, uh, about 14 years ago, there was a volcanology professor hired at the university and he set, established one of the best volcanology departments in the country. And there's one common thing among uh, geologists, never live in your field work area because it will become very routine. So for me, it's much more fascinating to travel to volcanoes and see new places than to live near a volcano. It's, it's just how it is. It's not a rule. There are many places on, on, on earth where in many countries where, like Switzerland, for example, a landlocked country with no, no volcano whatsoever, have the, some of the greatest research departments in this sure. field. Absolutely. Um, our next question comes from Central Park Elementary School, and those students are curious. Uh, can you tell us about the super volcano in Wyoming area in the United States? Do you believe it is going to erupt anytime soon? Uh, that's the question of the century, I guess. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the truth is we don't really know as much as we think we know about uh, super eruptions because we never get witness one, right? So everything uh, we know about super eruption is studying the field and interpreting it. But we know for sure that they are indeed super in terms of magnitude, in terms of how much material they, they put out there. And in order for all this material to come out to the surface, it needs to, to gather underground over time. And this amount of material takes hundreds of thousands of years to, to accumulate, right? So Yellowstone will have an eruption for sure in the future. We cannot say if it will be tomorrow or 100 years from now. We're monitoring and we're doing our best we can. And again, we are not sure if it will, the next eruption will be a super eruption. Maybe it will be a smaller eruption and depressurize the system. So there's a lot of unknowns here because we never witnessed such an eruption. But the question remains, yeah, uh, it's not when, uh, it's not if, it's when. It will erupt at some point. We don't know for sure when, but I will. I will. I, I won't be <laughs> very hard about it erupting in the next. Uh, I don't know, ten years or so. So you may relax here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And our last question for this morning is going to be: How often do you travel to volcanoes for your studies and your research? Uh, well, before the Cyrus the virus presented itself to the world last year. Uh, I would say four or five times a year, I will go in the field or well, for workshops or uh, conferences where volcanologists meet and interact. Uh, it all depends on what aspects of volcanoes one studies. I personally do physical volcanology. So the part that deals with the field a lot. So I, I go four or five times a year, I would say, in different places. My main area is South America, so I've been in in Peru, Argentina, uh, Ecuador. And I'll be going a lot. I have a lot of other field was planned. All right, Robert, thank you so much for your presentation, for sharing your expertise. We really appreciate yeah, sure. you morning with us here today. Happy to have the chance to do that. Thank you. All right, Stephanie. Thank you. And thanks everyone for joining us today. A very special thank you to Robert, our scientist, as well as the Lee County um, public school system for partnering with us to bring this live stream to you today. You can learn more about our programs by visiting our website as well as our social media 
And teachers, we encourage you to request an individualized scientist visit for your classroom by clicking on the link that you can find in the chat box. Once again, we'll be back today at 2.30 p.m. with more on plate tectonics. Until then, we will see you next time. Bye-bye.